Join me in prayer. Eternal God, we are grateful and thankful. Thankful for this day and its mercies. Thankful for grace, for the mistakes that we shall make. Grateful for the gathering of your saints into this assembly. We're grateful for worship and for your presence among us. God, now, in the preaching of your word, we pray, both in the hearing of your word, the reading of your word, and the proclamation of your word, we pray for clarity. We pray for insight. We pray that you would open the mysteries of faith to us. And then God, use the preacher to proclaim your word your way that what you would have say would be said to the hearts and minds of those who need a word from you. Speak through your written word. Speak, speak through your spoken word and speak through your preacher. We give thanks for all that we shall hear and do and experience. In the name of Christ, who is King. Amen. The gospel lesson comes from John, chapter 18, beginning at the 33rd verse and running to the 37th verse. I will not read all of the lesson, but I will only read the culmination of the lesson in verse 37. I encourage you to read it all, not just on Sunday, but throughout the week. John chapter 18, verse 37 reads simply, Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the word of God for people, for the people of God to which we all can say thanks be to God. Let me begin by thanking Pastor Randy and Pastor Heather and Pastor Patrice for your gracious hospitality and the invitation to walk about a mile down the road. I didn't walk. But to come down the road just a little way to a neighbor, a friend of the seminary, a hospitable place, thank you for allowing us to parade in our peacock feathers last week in the installation and inauguration. It went off uh, very well, and that was a tribute to this congregation and hopefully continues in our relationship with the East Liberty Presbyterian Church. Thank you for welcoming me and my family to the city of Pittsburgh, coming from, I guess you all call it the South. It is not the South at all, but coming from Washington, D.C. <laughs> Some people call it another world. But anyway, I am grateful for the hospitable welcome that I have experienced in all quadrants of the city, civic, religious, business, and otherwise. And so I'm excited to be here and to be an ambassador for the, one of Pittsburgh's uh, oldest institutions, the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and grateful to be here today. Now to our lesson. This morning we find ourselves in the Gospel of John at a critical point in the ministry of Jesus. John, the Gospel writer, in this 18th chapter records his portrayal of the trial of Jesus. And unlike in the synoptic, synoptic tradition, where there's an emphasis on the conspiracies of the religious elites, Jesus confronts, and, and Jesus' confrontation of the religious and civic authority, John's articulation of this moment has a more significant meaning. But first, let me give you some context to the preceding verses from what I read. 
Jesus, at the beginning of this chapter, is betrayed by Judas and led to a place where, he's, where he is to be arrested. At the moment of his arrest, Peter pulls out his switchblade and cuts a man named Malchus, cuts his right ear off. Jesus rebukes Peter for his act, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But he tells him, put your sword back into its sheath. I am not to drink, am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Once Jesus is arrested, he's brought before the high priest Caiaphas. John does not give us the details of the interrogation, but it is clear from his rendering that it's a pro forma matter. It's designed to give the appearance of compliance with the religious and civil law and the customs of the day. From the court of the high priest, Jesus is then brought to Pilate, the setting for our passage today. But in order to understand the significance of this setting, it's worthwhile to talk about Pilate. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, is Caesar's representative in the province. He is the fullness of the power of the empire and the emperor. And while there has been much written and explored about the history and legacy of Pilate, both in the secular and religious publications, the point I want to lift up here is that Pilate represents a particular expression of kingdom. He, by virtue of his office, status, and role in the context, text, and in history, he is Rome. Rome with all of its power. Rome so powerful that it's both an empire and a noun. Rome, the greatest military and administrative power the world had known to that point. Rome, the earthly culmination of sovereignty, authority, law, and order. Pilate is the embodiment of Rome and all that Rome is meant to be. And that is why he's brought into this sordid tale to begin with. The conspirators need the power of an earthly kingdom to get rid of a singular problem, Jesus. But when Pilate is first asked by the conspirators to weigh in on the status of Jesus, Pilate is ambivalent. Take him yourselves. Judge him according to your law. He says with a bit of arrogance in a way that suggests that he believes Jesus is a matter beneath him beneath the dignity of Rome, therefore beneath his office and beneath all that Pilate stands for. However, in the imperial context of the day, only Rome can determine matters of fate. Only Rome has the sanction, the power, and the authority to determine life or death. It is the conspirators that want to kill Jesus, and if they want to kill him, they need Rome. They bring him to Pilate anyhow which places us squarely in the passage I read today. But it's more than it appears. For John, the gospel writer, this moment is less about a trial and more about a clash of kingdoms. It's a showdown, but it's bigger than that. It's a confrontation between Pontius Pilate and Jesus, yes, but it's also between a Roman governor and a Jewish rabbi. It's also between empire and movement leader. It's between sovereign mandates of empire and the spirit of God at work in the world. It's between Rome as earthly power and Jesus, the incarnate logos of God. For us gathered here, this exchange gives us a perspective of who ultimately reigns in our life. And in our world, like Pilate and the religious conspirators, we too often put our faith and trust in the systems and structures of our own kingdoms. We have, in this day and age, worked hard in our society to promote good values that pro prop up our earthly kingdom. As helpful as uh, we have in this day and age uh, uh, lifted up things like money, politics, justice, power, to support our power structures and as helpful as money can be, as noble as power exercise rightly is, as useful as politics is, and as morally sound as justice administrated correctly can be, 
These are all still values that build a society on earthly terms. And while there's nothing wrong in and of themselves with any of those values, my simple observation is that before we judge Pilate too harshly for holding up his kingdom, we too represent a 21st century version of the same. We, you and I, are representatives of our king and queendoms here and now. That's why looking at this exchange between Jesus and Pilate is an important one for us. Listening in on this exchange will give us insight into the, what really matters in kingdom business and this kingdom that Jesus refers to in this 18th chapter. Jesus offers us some purposes in this exchange that we can learn about for our collective benefit. At first, Jesus, seeming, according to Pilate, is not worth paying attention to. As I said earlier, when asked by Pilate if he's a king, Jesus turns the question back to Pilate. The question is too simplistic for John's Jesus. For Pilate, he just wants a quick bureaucratic resolution. After all, being a king in Rome is easy to address. There is but one king, Caesar. Rome stamps out all other kings. So when he's identified as king of the Jews, then Pilate via Rome, or Rome via Pilate, must act. Kill the rival king, and consequently, you eliminate the rival kingdom. It's a simple dynamic. Power only understands the world on its terms. Kings only understand the world via other power systems. Pilate, Pilate only understands Jesus as simply another king. Yet the first insight on the purposes of this kingdom is that Jesus' kingdom is greater and bigger and wider than any earthly kingdom we can think of. In verse 36, Jesus goes on to explain to, to, to Pilate, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Jesus, the rabbi leader with no army, no navy, and no elected position, tells Caesar in the person of Pilate that Rome is beneath him. This kingdom is not from this world. Jesus tells Pilate, and us, that this work, this entity, this movement, this kingdom, this thing that Jesus is leading is not born of the earthly systems and powers of this world. And, and there's several really important things I want us to get here today from this exchange. First, there is the misidentification of Jesus as king. Jesus never accepts the title king. He only allows Pilate to use his understanding his limited understanding to frame a conversation. Pilate, as Rome, only has a one-dimensional understanding of Jesus, a rival king, and therefore a threat. But that is so limiting and, in fact, a bit perverse about the movement that Jesus has built to this point. And, you know, I have to say that we in the church have fallen into the same trap by using the language of king, even Christ the king. We limit our imagination. And I know by labeling, king, labeling him king, we identify him as sovereign of, over all human governments, that he is more than any limited king can have. And that, in fact, is the problem because Jesus gave us more than a kingdom. He's not simply an earthly monarch or president or potentate. Jesus comes to actually redefine those relationships. He overturns what governments do. He reorders life. Jesus tells Pilate, you say I am a king. The subtle message that Jesus didn't say is, but I'm so much more than that. The second lesson here from this exchange has to do with the character of the kingdom that Jesus talks about. Too many times there are movements in our world that take the name of Jesus and yet carry all of the systemic and polemic characteristics that have defined a worldly kingdom. 
the political, the social, and the economic models of Jesus' movement ought to be embody a different understanding and a commitment that's bigger and broader than the rest of the movements that we often see. That's why Jesus rebukes Peter for the violence he deploys early in the chapter. Violence is not how this kingdom will come about or shall live. Its purpose is greater in the world. And, and lastly, just in this little exchange, th 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 there is the use of the linguistic tool. John uses the preposition from, as in out of, and not simply of. Said this way, my kingdom is not from this world. It denotes that Jesus' kingdom has origins in some other place, space, time. It does not say my kingdom is not of this world. And I think we often get those confused. For while Jesus' work is not from this world, it ought to have influence in this world. Jesus' kingdom purposes are not grounded in the world, but it will use the resources and the tools and the elements that are often part of this world to grow and expand and enlarge and make greater influences bigger than any one person can do. Don't get stuck on the otherworldliness of the kingdom's origins that you lose sight of the influences of those purposes here and now. Jesus calls us to a work of building the movement that he starts in order to influence the world as it is, especially in the face of modern day Pontius Pilate's. It leads me to another key insight. Jesus' kingdom may not be a kingdom at all. Kingdoms have kings. And as I just said, Jesus never takes the title of king. Kingdoms have borders and armies, laws and punishments. But Jesus has none of these elements, at least not in the traditional sense. For when Pilate again confronts him with the title, Jesus instead gives him a purpose, the truth. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Jesus is here, not to rule, not to reign or hoard power, but to show us the way the way of the truth of life, the truth of power, the truth of God's love for the world. He didn't come to be king because if my Johannine Christology is right, I have to teach for a moment because I am a seminary president. If I'm correct, Jesus, according to John, was already cosmic from John chapter 1. He was already ruling as logos of God. He didn't need to come to earth for a title he already had. His purpose was to give witness to truth. He isn't the sovereign, but he leads as a son. Jesus is here to show us the real nature of power and kingdom, and that is self-empowering love that would die on a cross. Real purpose of power, which is the sign and embodied of a humble teacher who is willing to die for his lesson. The real purpose of power, to share it for the sake of others who don't have it. The purpose of power, to make crooked places straight and wounded people whole. Jesus is, Jesus is talking about is not a kingdom with its hierarchical and patriarchal connotations and structures. Nor does he simply come to redefine the word. What Jesus describes and what Jesus embodies is a community divinely birthed, a holy movement, a radical reordering of our shared life toge together, perhaps even an egalitarian neighborhood, a communion of faithful travelers with an allegiance to the truth, a bond of discipleship that does not live for the sake of themselves, but for the sake of the truth of his witness in the world. This fellowship doesn't lord it over one another, 
and doesn't keep tabs on who's in and who's out, but it offers a singular invitation. Follow me and I'll show you who you really are. Follow me and you'll discover the truth. You know, the more that I think about it, the, the, this movement reminds me of my grandmother's relationship to our neighborhood in East Cleveland, Ohio. Each summer I would go to visit and stay the summer there with her and it never failed. Almost every day there would be somebody who would come by and share a bit of their hurt, share on the porch a bit of their struggle, a bit of their pain. Sometimes they would ask to pick vegetables in her garden to supplement the food that they were getting on welfare. Other times they would tell us about the, the family down the street who was struggling because Pop lost his job and they needed some resources. And later on that evening, while it wasn't gossip, my grandmother would use that information to cook a little more dinner and then send my grandfather down the block to drop off the excess, not the leftovers, the excess of what was there. And I discovered on that 2200 block of East 97th Street, in the shadow of broken factories and folks living in tough economic times there were, where, where, where there were power and empire had exploited the leaders and the neighbors in community, there was a kind of kingdom and fellowship and a neighborhood that stood in contrast to the powers that had created the surroundings that they were living in. It was an outpost, a borderland, of the movement that Jesus was challenging Pilate with oh so long ago. My grandmother and a few other neighbors served others and helped the community, not just because it made them feel good, but because they heard the Savior say, follow me, do as I have done, love your neighbor as yourself. They did it because Jesus told them to, and Jesus himself says, when you listen to me, you are part of the kingdom, the neighborhood, the fellowship, the movement. And beloved, that for us is not a purpose, but a consequence of living into Jesus' reign. When we are true and we live into the truth, we're found to be citizens of the kingdom. When we're obedient to Jesus and the truth of his teaching by sharing the power that we have, we're found to be neighbors in God's community. When we love our neighbors as ourselves and give from our abundant blessings and, and serve those who God presents to us to serve, we bring forth the reign of Christ more fully. For the borderland of this kingdom is in our heart. The territory that we claim is in our mind and in our body. The outposts are any place where someone loves Christ. The flag is the banner of Jesus Christ. The symbol and sign is the cross of Jesus Christ. Our anthem is simply lift high the cross. Love of God reigns. We're called here to share in the reign of Christ, not as princes and princesses, not as kings or queens, but as joint heirs with Jesus. And like a shared community with an elder brother as our guide, each of us living to the glory of God shows forth the reign of Christ the King. Amen.